All right, everybody, we're going to go kicking this off. I know we're a little bit early, but that's, uh, I think, okay. It's okay by you. It's okay by me. All right. So uh, the final one that we have today is going to be, uh, it's a broad-reaching topic. Um, it goes around drones, autonomous robots, and semi-autonomous robots. And this gets to sort of the crux of what a lot of us like to think of, which is that next realm of sentient beings in, in a robot. And, you know, there's arguments about whether that's right around the corner or whether that's even possible. Um, one of the groups that we had out at JSConf this year, they really took the pool uh, to a new level, was the Open ROV, which is Robotic Oceanographic Vehicle. A remotely operated vehicle, but we can or, go with that too. I like yours better than mine. Um, so what they do is it's an open source platform for exploring uh, water-based uh, environments. And it is really, really cool. It actually uses JavaScript to be programmed at yes. some level in some parts. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm going to turn it over and let you talk about the open ROV. Thank you. So um, hello. My name's Brian. I um, work for Open ROV, which is a well, let me get this going real quick. There we go. Um, Open ROV, which is a group that makes really cheap and accessible robotics and instruments for people to explore the world around them. Uh, myself, about two years ago, I was deep into web development, considered myself a full stack developer, and had a deep yearning to figure out how in the heck can I actually make a robot do something. I wanted to see something move in the physical world. I had an opportunity when this company, OpenROV, which wasn't a company at that point, launched their Kickstarter. Um, and it turned out to be a very successful Kickstarter. They did like you know, over $120,000 or something, which back then was a lot of money. Um, and I signed up for the kit so that I could build it with my youngest son and help him get involved with robotics. I got the kit in December of that year, and it took me about a month and a half to build it out. In doing that, I had to learn about um, I had to learn about soldering, so I bought some of the, the maker shed, like learn to solder kits. And by the way, if you're starting out, the, um, skip the surface mount ones. Those are a little hard. Um, so anyhow, that was part of my experience. I got really good at soldering, though, because I used those. Uh, working with acrylic, working with acrylic cement, and figuring out actually how to fabricate and model physical structures that way, which is what's used inside the open ROV. I had to dust off uh, electronics experience that was long gone from my head. Um, and wiring things up and testing and working with everything inside of it. So it was a really a good, it was a, a full featured kit that I got to get into and use. And again, I, so it took a, a month and a half to build it. And after that, really my goal was I wanted to make this do something. Uh, I wanted to build a robot that I could give it just general commands and it go do something. I didn't want something that I could just sit there and remote control. Because um, I'm a programmer, I'm thinking robots should be able to control themselves. So, um, I went and I got involved with the community. Now, for me, now, what I'd like to do is share with you how I got involved with that community in the hopes that if you are looking at one of the robotic systems that interest you and there's already a vibrant community, perhaps this might give you some insight and ways to approach them and become involved with them. In my case, I challenged myself to do 30 commits in 30 days. And there we go. Um, 30 commits in 30 days. And in doing so, um, whether those were finding spelling mistakes somewhere in the code, whether that was pulling something from the issue list that I thought was an easy fix to work on, or whether that was adopting a feature and putting it out there, even with the possibility that they would reject the request, um, I went and I committed to doing so. And um, so anyhow, in GitHub, in the GitHub history, you'll see my, my takeoff, boom, a bunch of commits, and then it dropped off after the 30 days as I caught my breath. Um, but it did a couple, two great things for me. A, it got a lot of respect inside that community. They were thrilled to see somebody coming in and actually spending time contributing back to them. Uh, two, I learned that code base inside and out enough that I was able to take it over um, and be the lead maintainer on that project. So uh, that was my experience. It worked very well to get involved. And uh, for those of you that it helps, um, great. Uh, one of the first features, well, before I jump to this, let me talk a little bit more about this robot, mostly because I think it makes a great hacking platform. Of course, you can hack the drones. Um, you're already working with sumo bots and controlling something on land. We have the node bots, uh, node boats, excuse me, on top of the water. But 
to date, I really haven't seen anything go under the water. And so underwater and space seem like the two remaining places that we can go. And I have a solution for one of those. And it's nice because a lot of you have pools and lakes and things that you can go. And the water is the last unexplored territory. It's the last place you can go and actually put eyes where nobody else has been. So uh, for a lot of people, the exploration is a nice reason to have the ROV. I myself stick in the backpack when I go to Hawaii, and I have something to do when the wife is busy sunning. So uh, about this robot, it's prosumer. What I mean by that, it's not just a toy. This is actually used by researchers as well. It can go to 100 meters, so that's deeper than most people are going to be able to ever scuba dive. And it can sit out there and loiter for a good two hours while it's surveying the area around it. Uh, it has three motors. It has a big sensor payload in bed. Uh, there's an IMU underneath of this, which is, um, there's an I2C bus. Okay, great. There's an I2C bus that actually comes outside the electronic chassis. And so for those of you who aren't familiar, there's a couple different ways you have um, your different electronical systems communicate in robotics. SPI is one format. I2C is another format. You have serial lines. You can do Ethernet. Well, this one uses I2C, and it has a, a, what we call an IMU, which is a depth sensor and uh, MPU 9150. So same type of um, system that allows you to know the orientation of your cell phone that we have inside the robot so they can figure out what its orientation happens to be underwater. Um, and with the depth sensor on that, I was able to, one of the, the early pieces of software that we added to the system was this concept of depth hold. And so this talk is intended to give you an overview of autonomous and semi-autonomous vehicles. This was a semi-autonomous mod, which I'll talk about in a moment. But what depth hold essentially does, so you can visualize it, it's basically, let's make the robot a little bit smarter. And so as we drove down, we'd get to it deep enough and we'd say, turn on depth hold. And so if we're at 30 meters, we're controlling it. At 30 meters, we turn on depth hold. Now at this point, the robot's controlling the vertical propeller and it's keeping it at 30 meters. This is important because as you're driving something like this, which on a robot may be an unstable system in certain situations, if our ROV pitches down and you're thrusting, you're now actually thrusting down. But wait, I don't want to lose. I don't want to go down. I was just trying to thrust forward. So the system will autocorrect by running the vertical motor to pull you back up to your target depth. So that's how it makes it easier for the pilot to drive the ROV. All right, I'm gonna switch back. Um, and last thing for, for programmers, you know, definitely you wanna find systems that you enjoy programming on. My last call out to the open ROV is that it does have a beagle bone inside of it. It's running Node.js. It's paired with an Arduino. So there's Arduino code on it as well. So it's a nice hybrid system to work with. And all the control is actually using HTML5 in the browser. We have gamepad controls in there. We're using WebGL for a lot of 3D acceleration and a lot of cool things. So it's a very rich playground of what I think are interesting development technologies that are there to be played with. So let me go more into now the autonomous side of the house. Really quickly, differenti differentiate between autonomous and semi-autonomous. Um, you can see the definitions I put up there, but basically autonomous, the thing's gonna run its mission for itself. Uh, you program it, tell it what you wanna do, and say go. In semi-autonomous, the human being is still in the loop. And usually what you then do is you have something that the robot is in charge of that makes it easier for the pilot to complete that mission. Uh, you'll see this used in all kinds of things around the world. Um, in undersea applications, there are a lot of, one of the main things ROVs do is they map the underwater seafloor. And the way they do that is they run what are called transects. So when the Malaysia flight went missing, they deployed three of these ROVs in the area and basically said, you know what, I want you to go kilometers up, turn, go five more meters, turn, come kilometers back, and keep doing that and basically until you start running low on juice. At which point, it would surface, they'd motor over, they'd retrieve it, and they would take the sensors that had been running and basically upload those for analysis back on top side. So the ROV's job, tow a sensor bay in a very predictable pattern. The picture there is from a, I like this ROV. Most ROVs are shaped like torpedoes. There's a, this is Hawaii, they've shaped there slightly different. Um, another big thing, so on the semi-autonomous bent, quadcopters, inherently unstable. The reason they've taken off is because they've added control loops inside that to stabilize it. And from a pilot standpoint, that means you sit there and all you have to do is tell it, hey, add thrust and go up, 
lower thrust and go down. The fact that it's having to do a lot of minute changes to keep the thing from flipping over is shielded from you. So that's an example of where semi-autonomous is helping out in the piloting of a craft. And then, of course, there's trains, planes, automobiles, and ships, where at this day and age, you really don't want your pilot getting creative on landing. You want kind of a precise, repeatable, just do it like the plane before you. And that's something that robots are really good at. Now, all of those examples of autonomous and semi-autonomous applications, they hold a shared set of problems and nomenclature that it would be helpful to be familiar with. So what I'd like to do now is just talk about some of the vocabulary words and concepts that you will come around if you are spending time trying to make your own robotic system somehow autonomous or semi-autonomous. Uh, the first one that you'll hit, control systems. Now, this is a whole set of theory and PhDs handle in college. Um, really, it comes down to this. You need a way with various sensor feedback loops coming in to look at the data that's coming in and then figure out what commands to send to the servos or motors so they do things. At the end of the day, that's what the control system's all about. Now, you can start, and I encourage you to start with very basic control systems. Now, if you talk to a lot of the electrical engineers, they'll freak out because, like, it can't be this simple. But in reality, many times, it does end up being this simple. Now, this is a loop. This is a pretend uh, vehicle, and you're just, this is a very poor man's, I want you to go 55 miles an hour. And all this algorithm's going to do, it's going to hunt. It's going to go up to 55 miles an hour, find out it's going a little too fast, slow it back down, find out it's going too slow, speed back up again. Now, in a car, that's not a great um, algorithm. But in many actual real-world applications, it tends to work really well. And so don't be scared of putting control systems into your robotics. Start with something simple. And if it doesn't solve the problem, then go look for more complex solutions. Everybody has an Arduino that is in their kits. Um, if you go to the Arduino's website and you search for PID, which stands for the Proportional Integral Derivative Controller, this is the most popular control system that's out there in the world. This is what makes the quadcopters stable. Um, this is what guides the ships. This is what's handling a lot of the control systems on auto-driving cars. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the theory. I will say on the website, there's wiki links to the, or uh, links to these set of blog collections that do a great job explaining how these PID controllers work. What I will do is give you an example of how this differs from what we saw in the basic example. So the P in a PID controller stands for proportional. All that means is this logic, it says, hey, if I want to be at 55 miles an hour, how far away am I? And it, the further away I am, the more throttle I'm going to apply to get back to 55 miles an hour. That's the proportional piece. It's actually that simple. Now, what happens in applications is that there's this concept called gains. And if any of you guys are flying quadcopters, and have had to set these up, I'm sure you've seen these and it's made your eyes bleed because quadcopters can have lots of gain values, which are basically magic numbers that somehow, if you get them right, help the system may remain stable in lots of different situations. Um, so there's this concept of gain values, and what will happen is the proportional control will sit there and say, I don't want to just, you know, not if I'm 10 miles an hour away, do I provide the thrust or do I accelerate at a factor of 10, one for every mile per hour, per hour I'm off, or what a gain value does is it says, do I go at half that? If I'm 10 miles an hour off my target, do I increase my speed by five miles, or my thrust, if you will, to the equivalent of 5% to try to speed it up? That would be a half gain. And then you can do multiples of that and increase those gains. So that's kind of concepts you'll run into when you hit the PID controllers, and that's all it means, nothing to be scared of. In fact, uh, the 10 lines of code that I show up there are the, uh, is the simple example for implementing that PID controller logic in your Arduino. So it's something very accessible that you can go ahead and use. In this case, it's basically taking its, uh, its input that's reading off analog zero. It basically has a target of what it wants that input to be, and then it has a control line that's doing. So it's going to send a value, a voltage, through that analog write that is going to be increasing or decreasing the value that's coming from the analog read. And it just keeps adjusting those until it gets the right read value back. Again, I'll be available after all this if you want a more detailed discussion about what some of these control loops look like. Look like. Um, 
But that's one of the problems that all of these different autonomous systems run into. And once you can actually control your system, you run into the next problem, which is if you're doing anything where you're trying to actually move a robot around, you're going to run into the question of how does the robot know where it is? It's, yeah, it's easy for you to see it, but you think about it, what are the sensors on the robot that tells it where am I? Well, in the quadcopter space, what you've seen is mass adoption of GPS devices. In fact, multiple GPS devices, so they can get the GPS locks and hopefully hold them. Underwater, which is my domain, uh, we don't have that advantage because wireless doesn't penetrate water for any appreciable distance. So instead, they have these crazy um, um, acoustic systems that basically will ping from multiple locations, and they can use triangulation to figure out then where they are relative to some surface buoys. And then on the surface, they have the GPS coordinates for where those buoys are at. And so that's how they do a lot of positioning underwater. But whatever your domain is, you'll have to figure out how is that system going to know where it's at. There's other solutions. You can have external cameras that go ahead and take a picture of something and have a feedback loop back to that device that lets it know what its relative position is to the camera. Lots of ways you can do it. But you'll have to think about how is my system going to know where it's at. One of the other solutions that we use, um, and this will drive into the next slide, it's not just the acoustic solutions we have. Many of these ROVs and many other platforms, including quadcopters, have what are called IMUs on board, which are an inertial, inertial measuring unit. All that does is sit there and have a combination of gyroscopes, accelerometers, perhaps, really, perhaps magnetometers, all these sensors, so they can figure out the orientation of the vehicle. And that's what the IMU does. Now, in very expensive systems, the IMU is accurate enough, and when I say expensive systems, I'm talking about US government nuclear subs. They can actually take a surface reading and go underwater for potentially a month and know their, and use the accelerometer information to derive velocity over time to figure out what their position is relative to where they took a surface reading from before and be relatively accurate. These consumer grade devices though that you see on quadcopters in the submarine and many applications that are under $20,000, um, they don't have the uh, sophistication or the precision in those instruments to effectively do that. What happens is the you're in the math where they're doing all this, the error becomes exponential as they sit there and are deriving the velocities. So long story short, I can talk more about it later, but that's some of the complexity that makes tracking with an inertial measuring unit, um, your actual location, a difficult thing to do. Now, one of the other problems, uh, I would say, um, the problems related to this aren't <laughs> restricted to IMU usage. Um, none of these instruments are actually really precise in the consumer space. And in the quadcopter space, I don't know, you can raise your hands. How many of you know what a drone flyaway is? Just out of curiosity. Okay, we have a few hands up. Um, if you don't, if you go to Google and you search for drone flyaway, you'll get over 44,000 hits of somebody documenting how their ROV got a mine, of, or their quadcopter got a mine of its own, and decided it was located in, I don't know, Switzerland, and just flew off. Sometimes never to come back. Um, it's a real problem. In fact, I have a link here, and the slides will be made available for the YouTube. Um, there's this whole set of parodies that have been put in place because members are so upset and it's such a large phenomenon, they're hilarious to watch. So I encourage you to do so if you're more curious about what's going on in people's minds when they see these drone flyaways. But my point in all of doing this is what you're, what you're running into with consumer grade sensors is you don't have enough reliability or precision in them to necessarily be 100% reliable, right? So um, this is a problem in that space. To help address that problem, there's a whole other field of study called sensor fusion. And this is, again, something you'll run into when you talk about autonomous vehicles. All sensor fusion does is say, rather than rely on one sensor, I'm going to have arrays of different types of sensors that are not all susceptible to the same type of error. So in my underwater example, um, one of the great things about these, we go search for treasure. Right? We go down, we look at wrecks. If I know the wreck is to the north and I'm flying following a compass, that's great. If I go next to a shipwreck that's full of iron, my magnetometer all of a sudden starts pointing and becoming like, a, you know, like I'm searching for metal you know, in the sand, right? It just gives me these weird reading, readings, but it's not telling me where north is anymore. Well, when that happens, I need the sensor fusion means I have a, other sensors I can rely on as well, and I have algorithms that will arbitrate between them to figure out which should I trust. And so in this example, it would say, wow, something's really screwy with the readings I'm getting off the magnetometer. They're just... They don't match up to what the accelerometer and the gyroscopes are telling me. So I'm going to switch to a gyroscope right now, 
which will be accurate for the next 20 minutes or so of flight time because I can't trust what the magnetometer is telling me. So that's a real world example of how sensor fusion works. So that's an, another area thing that you'll run into. And when you're trying to figure out, I have multiple sensors, what do I do with it? That's what you want to look up on Wikipedia and start, start following links for. And because sensor fusion's out there, one of the other sensors that now has become very ubiquitous is the camera. The cameras have gotten so cheap today that um, a whole set of uses in robotics has popped up. Uh, what I want to call out real quick, in our case, we have, you can't really tell here, but I have two scaling lasers. I have, I have an underwater robot with lasers. Um, I have two scaling lasers on here. They're 10 centimeters apart. And what that means is the farther something is away from it, the closer together those laser lights are going to reflect back on the image. So as I get closer, they seem to spread out. Well, you can measure that in real time and do trigonometry to figure out exactly how far away the thing you're, you're lighting up with the lasers happens to be. And we actually had a community member using HTML5, Canvas, WebGL, and some basic vision algorithms that are now available in JavaScript, and there's very complex ones as well, would identify where the lasers were in the shot and in real time tell you how far away that thing was. So that's an example of one of the areas computer vision is helping give the robot more data that it can actually utilize. Another example, optical flow is one that you'll hear. It's, very, it's really rising up again now in the quadcopter space. They had some challenge getting the algorithms and the equipment cheap enough. But now it's back. Optical flow identifies particles on the screen and between frames maps where those particles are going relative to each other and with very advanced math can give you information about your actual velocity and the velocity of the things that are moving around the screen. And you can paint pretty images like this to kind of show what that looks like. Um, those algorithms now, while well, you can do them on your computer and everything else, um, they're now popular enough that they're putting those on chips with specialized cameras right on them. This is an example of one of those. And so if this is something that interests you and you want to try it, you don't have to find all the software libraries yourself and wire this up. You can buy something off the shelf that will actually go ahead and give you the resulting feedback that you can start utilizing your robots today. So that's ultimately what I wanted to cover as far as kind of an overview of the types of things that you'll run into when talking about autonomous vehicles. Um, what I would like to leave you with at this point, um, this is a big field. I mean, in a, in a survey of the types of challenges and things you'll run into, there's no way that I can go deep in any one of these. Um, there's a ton of stuff online about this. The quadcopter space is very rich in this. There are packages that help with autonomous in pretty much every language platform. Um, if you're interested in those, ROS, R-O-S, is the robot operating system. There's a lot of Python and C++ that usually pulls that um, suite of tools together. But that has a lot of advanced logic, both in mission planning and in um, feedback loops to your actual robots. Uh, what we're doing at OpenROV, we're using a lot of the uh, JavaScript libraries to um, do a lot of this stuff today, and it's a massive, rich pool of stuff off of GitHub that you can pull. So a lot of resources that you can go to uh, to do all this. Um, I will be hanging out in the makerspace after this. You'll see my email address and my Twitter ID here. One thing I did want to point out, uh, later today, and I'm not sure, it depends on what time we're doing all of the beach stuff, but at some point today, um, I'm going to go ahead and bring one or two of these down to the pool, and I'll be driving these. Feel free to come down and play with depth hold and play with some of these concepts. Um, I will tweet out to the uh, robots2014 Twitter hashtag when that's happening, um, or feel free to ping me if you have any questions about that. All right, I'll be around. Thank you.